important. So, oh, we just introduced the Galfon transform, um, and we are about to prove a theorem that, uh, so if we had an abelian unidole C star algebra, then the Galfon transform gave an isomorphism between that C star algebra and continuous functions on the spectrum. So this was the theorem we were about to prove. Uh, so let's go ahead and start with some preliminaries. Uh, so A will be a unital uh, Banach algebra. To start with, uh, and let me recall first that the Gelfand transform, so the Gelfand transform is the map which takes A to continuous functions on the spectrum of A. And let me remind you that the spectrum of A, this was the collection of homomorphisms from A into the complex numbers, uh, which turned out to be the same as continuous homomorphisms uh, from A into the complex numbers. Uh, uh, so that this naturally lives inside the dual and so had a topological compact uh, topology as a subset of the dual of A. And the Galfond transform gives a, a mapping from A to continuous functions on the spectrum, uh, which is given by gamma of some element A at some homomorphism chi is just chi of A. So it's just like when you embed a Banach space into its double dual, uh, it's the same formula here. So this is the Gelfand transform. Uh, of course, typically the double dual of a Banach space is much, much larger than the Banach space itself. Um, but as it happens, at least for C star algebras, we'll see that this gives an isomorphism between uh, these two spaces. So the first thing we'll do is a lemma here, which is that even for a general Banach algebra, uh, this is at least a contractive uh, homomorphism. So uh, this is a contractive homomorphism. And it still remembers uh, the spectrum in the sense that uh, an element in, will be invertible in A if and only if its image is invertible over here. Uh, and A in A is invertible if and only if Uh, contractive meaning has norm less than one. Right. Uh, no, less than or equal to. Right. Uh, okay, so let's uh, prove. Let's give a proof of this fact. I'm sure, I'm sticking with my notes. All right. Uh, so, uh, first of all. To see that it's a homomorphism is pretty obvious uh, because here everything's abelian. So uh, gamma AB times, I mean, all of this is pretty obvious here. So this is uh, chi AB, but chi is a homomorphism. So this is chi of A, chi of B, which is gamma A uh, times gamma B, the function. Remember that function operations are just point-wise. All right, so therefore it's a homomorphism. Um, and uh, it's also easy to see that it's contractive. Uh, gamma A, what's the norm of gamma of A? It's the supremum norm, so we just plug in any chi here. So this is chi of A. But well, we saw before that homomorphisms were contractive. This is something we showed. So this is less than or equal to the norm of A. And this was for every single uh, chi in the spectrum of A. Uh, and what else? So it's a contractive homomorphism. And now we just need to show that A is invertible if and only if gamma A uh, is invertible. So if, well, if A is invertible, 
then to see gamma, is a, gamma of A is invertible, it's easy, it's just the inverse of gamma of A inverse. So then gamma A, uh, gamma A inverse is gamma A, A inverse, and that's just one. Right? The homomorphism clearly takes the unit to the constant one function. Uh, and conversely, uh, so if um, gamma A is not invertible, so that means zeros in the spectrum of A, well, what, what can we do? We can look at the ideal generated by this, and we know that this is contained in some maximal ideal, and we know that maximal ideals are in correspondence with homomorphisms, so we get that therefore there exists some chi in the spectrum of A such that chi of A is equal to zero, such that A is in the kernel of chi. But what is this, this chi of A, this is exactly um, a gamma A applied to chi. So this means that gamma A has a zero, hence is not invertible. So I get that therefore gamma A is not invertible. All right, so that's a little lemma that holds for all Bonnach algebras. Uh, now specifying the, specifying the C-star algebras, we can prove Galfand's theorem. So this is that I mentioned at the beginning of class. That is, that if A is a unital uh, abelian C-star algebra, so then the Galfan transform is an isomorphism. Is uh, A star? All right, so in other words, every abelian unital Seaster algebra is really just continuous functions on some compact Hausdorff space. Um, and we know there, we know these are Seaster algebras quite well because Stone's theorem says that we can uh, associate the spectrum, the, we can encode the homomorphisms or isomorphisms here by exactly the spectrum. So it's completely determined by uh, the topological space. Um, okay. So let's go, so I claim that it's a star isomorphism, so we need to show that it preserves adjoints. So that's the first thing uh, we'll do. And to do that, we'll take the easy case first when A is self, when we have a self-adjoint element. So first, if we have A, which is self-adjoint in A, well, we proved before, last week, that if you have a self-adjoint element, then its spectrum is contained in the real line. So we know that therefore, the spectrum of A is contained in the reals. Uh, but we know that any, uh, any homomorphism on the algebra has to take any element into its spectrum. So this means that any homomorphism, so anything in the spectrum of A, has to take this lowercase a into the real line. In other words, the Galfand transform of A uh, maps into the real line. So therefore this is a, so we get therefore gamma A chi, this is chi of A, and this is in the spectrum of A, which we know is in the real line, uh, for all chi in the spectrum A. Uh, but what is that? So the gamma of A is therefore a real valued function. Uh, so of course then we have therefore gamma of A star, well, it's self-adjoint, so this is gamma of A, but this is also gamma of A bar, because it's a real valued function, uh, and therefore this is gamma of A, uh, oh, that's all I want to, I want to stop. Right? So we have that, at least for self-adjoint elements, it preserves this 
star structure. Uh, so now what about for a general element? Uh, so in general, well, just like with complex numbers, uh, any element in the C star algebra you can break into its real and imaginary parts. And so we'll do that here. Uh, so we, we write um, A is going to be equal to X plus IY. So we write where X is A plus A star over 2 is a self-adjoint element. And Y is uh, a star minus a over 2 times i. And this is also a self-adjoint element, since we put the i there. And uh, uh, you see, if you add these two things up, uh, we get exactly a. Good. So now we've written a as a x, a self-adjoint element, plus i times y, a self-adjoint element. And now we can see what is gamma of a star. Well, you just take the adjoint here, and this is gamma of x minus iy. But this, uh, since gamma is just a, a homomorphism, uh, you can see that this is gamma of x minus i gamma y. But now each of these gamma of x and gamma y are real valued functions, so there uh, we can put the bar over them, and we see that this is exactly gamma of x uh, plus i y uh, bar, right, which is gamma of a. So that shows that in general uh, we preserve the star structure. Uh, okay, so. We have that at least it's now not just a homomorphism, but a star homomorphism. And now we're in business. Uh, uh, we also know, what else can we say? We can also compute the uh, norm of gamma of A. Uh, What is this? This is exactly yeah. So this is the norm of gamma of a. So this is the supremum over all things. So this is just the um, uh, if you like the spectral radius of the norm. This is the sup norm. Uh, so this is the spectral radius. of this. Uh, but on the other hand, we know from the previous lemma that uh, gamma preserves invertibility. So in particular, it also preserves the spectrum. So therefore, it preserves the spectral radius. So this is the spectral radius of A, which is also the norm of A. Um, of course, A is normal, right, because um, the C star algebra is abelian, so every element in the C star algebra is normal. Right? And we showed that for normal elements, we have that equality there. Okay, so this shows that uh, it is isometric. Uh, in particular, the current that's an uh, injective map. So the only thing that we have to do is show that it's surjective. Uh, but what can we do? Well, it's an injective homomorphism, star homomorphism in algebra. So whatever the range is, we know that it's going to be some algebra uh, of continuous functions. So we know that gamma of A inside of this is an uh, algebra and closed under conjugation. So it's an algebra closed under conjugation. And we also know, of course, that uh, the Gelfand transform of the identity gives us the constant function. So this also contains constants. Uh, and contains constants. Uh, and finally, the thing to notice is that if we have two uh, elements of the spectrum, 
then they're obviously different at some point. Uh, so if we have chi 1 and chi 2 in the spectrum, then just as functions, they must be different at some point if they're not equal to each other. So chi 1 not equal to chi 2. So then there exists A such that uh, chi 1 of A is not equal to chi 2 of A. There's gamma A at chi 1, and that's gamma A at chi 2. And so what does this say? say? This says that something in the range of gamma separates points. So we know that therefore the range of gamma also separates points. Well, now we can invoke the stone wire stress theorem, right? We have an algebra, it's closed under adjoint, it uh, contains the constant functions that separates points, uh, so therefore, and it's closed, uh, so therefore it's dense, but we already know it's closed because we know gamma is an isometry. Right? Uh, so we get that, uh, therefore, uh, gamma of A closure is equal to all continuous functions in the spectrum of A, but we already know that that's the image since we know that it's isometric, so this is by stone wire stress. Hopefully I spelled wire stress correctly. Um, all right, any questions about this? A very nice theorem. Right? So this says that, in some sense, what is a C star algebra? Well, if it were abelian, then we get exactly the category of compact Hausdorff spaces. If we looked at abelian unit all C-star algebras, that uh, from Gelfand's theorem and Stone's theorem, this is more or less looking at the category of compact Hausdorff spaces. So this allows us to then say that uh, C-star algebras in general, uh, unit all C-star algebras in general, is the study of non-commutative compact Hausdorff spaces. This is the, the this is the philosophy. So C star algebras is really non-commutative topology. All right, and, uh, and then you can, if you take this philosophy, you can make a lot of things happen. And a lot of uh, the proofs in uh, C star algebras, uh, many of the proofs that you need, uh, they take various proofs you know for topological spaces, and then you adapt them on the function space level. So this is... Uh, uh, something you see over and over and over again. All right. Uh, there are also a number of nice applications of Gelfand's theorem. Uh, so one of the nicest is the following. So let me remind you that um, when we looked at... Uh, this one I want to do next. Uh, so let me remind you that when we, uh, if A and abelian C star algebra were generated by a single element, then we had a natural uh, homeomorphism between the spectrum of A and the spectrum of that element. So recall, so if A is abelian, uh, an abelian C star algebra, and A is the C star algebra generated by a single element. So it's a unital C star algebra generated by a single element. So then we had a natural homeomorphism between the spectrum of X and the spectrum of A, which was given to us by, um, well, the, this direction was the easiest. If you had some chi in the spectrum of uh, A, you just sent it to its image at X. And, uh, and this was a homeomorphism of these two spaces. So we showed this before. Uh, so this means that on this case, the Gelfand transform gives an isomorphism between continuous functions on the spectrum of X and uh, the C star algebra A. And so then this allows us to uh, define what, what, this allows us to define continuous functional calculus. Uh, 
which is as follows. So uh, in general, if A is a unital C star algebra, and we have X and A is normal, so if X is normal, well, then we can just look at the C star algebra that it generates. Uh, the unital C star algebra that it generates. And the unital C star algebra that it generates will be abelian because X is normal. So we can define then, so if F is in the a continuous function on the spectrum of X, we define F of X to be uh, I guess it'll be the inverse Gelfon transform of F, right? So where right, the Gelfon transform, so where the Gelfon transform maps the C star algebra generated by X and 1 to continuous functions on the spectrum, but then I'm identifying that with the spectrum of X. Review the Gelfand transform. This one. So no, I, no. I'm also in order to define this. We're also using the fact that the spectrum of X doesn't change from the algebra A that it's in, uh, that it starts in to the C star algebra that it uh, generates, which is another fact that we proved last week. So this is well defined. All right. So this is the definition of continuous functional calculus. So whenever we have a continuous function on the spectrum of a normal element. Uh, we can define f of that element in exactly this way. So this is the definition. Um, but we should make sure that this definition agrees with our intuition. So let's prove a theorem about this. Uh, so continuous functional calculus satisfies the following properties. So one is that uh, we should make sure it's consistent with our uh, usual notion if we have a polynomial, then you should just be able to plug x into that polynomial and you should get the thing. And that's the, ca that's the case here. So if uh, f is, uh, say, f of z is equal to some sum as i and j goes from, uh, say, 0 to k of a i j z to the i z bar to the j. So if we have some polynomial and, and z and z conjugate, uh, so then, uh, and again here, so this is a, a unital C star algebra and x and a as a normal element. So that's where we're all fixed for this. Uh, so then f of x, so by continuous functional calculus, agrees with our usual intuition that we can just plug x into where z is or x star where Z bar is. So that's good. Uh, two, this is the spectral mapping theorem, that is that uh, F of the spectrum of X, so this is, uh, so the spectrum of X is some, some compact subset of the complex numbers. This gives us another compact subset of the complex numbers, uh, and it's going to exactly equal the spectrum of f of x. It's another useful property. Uh, three, it behaves well with homomorphisms. So if phi mapping a to b is a unital star homomorphism, I guess here we also have b as another unit all C star algebra. Uh, 
so then, if we look at where does phi send f of x, it's the same as f at phi of x. So it behaves well with homomorphisms. Uh, four, we should wonder about composition. So if uh, G, so F is all fixed for all, uh, well, no, F is not necessarily fixed in the first one. So if uh, G is a continuous function on the range of F, so then, well, we can consider G composed F, apply that to X, or we can also consider uh, f of x, and then by condition 2, we know that the spectrum of this is contained in the range, so we can then apply g to this, so these are well defined and they're equal. And then finally, the last property I want to do is uh, what if we don't vary the functions, but what if we vary the elements, then what can happen? Uh, so if we have that xn and a are normal, and we have xn converging to x. Uh, so, of course, here there's no reason to expect that the spectrum of xn would equal to the spectrum of x, or even be contained in the spectrum of x in general. Uh, however, uh, if we allow ourselves a little bit of room, say take a neighborhood of the spectrum of x, then we're in business. So uh, if we have omega, a neighbor, a compact neighborhood of the spectrum of x, and if we have some f, a continuous function on omega, so we allow ourselves a little bit of room here. So then we have that the spectrum of xn is contained in maybe not the spectrum of x, but it'll be contained in any neighborhood uh, for large n. And if we look at uh, f of x minus f of xn, uh, then this will go to zero, as n tends to So if we fix our function and allow our elements x to vary, then we also have some continuity properties there. Uh, all right, so these are the basic properties of continuous functional calculus. And uh, yeah, 99% of everything you use continuous functional calculus for, you can just deduce from these properties right here. Is just a yeah, x is a normal element in a unital C star algebra. <coughs> What's that? Uh, yes, I wrote that. This, that's short for compact. That's short for neighborhood. So. It can, it's a compact set, which contains an open neighborhood of the, yeah. Yeah, for me, uh, um, uh, a neighborhood just means you contain an open set, which contains that point or that uh, other set. Um, for the first property, you can also have the infinite sum of uh, well, if you have infinite sums, then you have to deal with convergence issues. Uh, so then, yeah, it depends. Yeah. It depends what you mean by the convergence issue. Uh, say converges absolutely, then uh, I'm sure it follows from the other properties that we've written down there. Yeah. It should follow from number, well, one of these. Yeah. Uh, maybe the fact that it's coming from a homomorphism Right, so if the partial sums converge, then uh, there's no issue because we know that it comes from homomorphism. They go off on transform this. 
yeah, it would need to converge. Let's see if the sum converged uniformly on uh, on the compact set, then there's no issue with convergence. But if it doesn't converge uniformly on that compact set, then uh, then you might have some issues that you need to work with. All right. Uh, so let's prove all of these properties. And uh, all of them should be pretty easy to prove. Uh, it's mostly just diagram chasing and, and getting used to the notation. Uh, but let's verify maybe uh, some of them. Uh, so the first, oh, let's verify all of them. Uh, so the first property, how can we see that? Uh, so what is the Galfon transform, what does it mean here? Um, what happens when we plug in the Galfon transform at x and when we apply this to uh, some complex number t, or maybe z, right, where z is in the spectrum? Well, when we think about when we identify the spectrum with the spectrum of that C star algebra, what does this mean? This means that we're uh, just evaluating that homomorphism at x. But then by our identification, what does it mean to evaluate the homomorphism at x? Well, we're identifying the homomorphism with its image at x. So that means that evaluation at x under the identification is exactly just z again. So the Gelfand transform, if we fix x, this particular x, um, then the Gelfand transform from the C star algebra to this that I've defined here takes the this function, uh, or rather it takes x to this function, which takes z to z, the identity function. So therefore, so we've defined continuous functional calculus as the in inverse of this transform. So we get, therefore, if we have f of z is equal to z, so if we take the identity function, so then the inverse Gelfand transform of this, so then uh, f of x, which is defined to be the inverse of Gelfand transform of this x, uh, has to just be, um, has to be what gives us the identity function, which is x. That's equal to x. All right, so at least for f of x, we know that we get x. Now we also know that the Gelfand transform preserves the adjoint structure, so by the same uh, reasoning, if we have, I mean, it's not just a homomorphism, a star homomorphism, so we get that it pres preserves that. And yeah, like I said, the Gelfand transform is a star homomorphism, so once you know it preserves uh, this element, then you know it preserves all products of this and adjoints and sums, and that's all polynomials. Right, so then one follows since uh, gamma is a star isomorphism. All right, so that says that continuous functional calculus at least extends polynomial calculus. Uh, the other thing, all right, so two. Uh, two should just be the fact that uh, it's the Galfon transform of, of something. We know that the Galfon transform uh, preserves this, right? What is the spectrum of f of x? Well, this is, by definition, this is the spectrum of the inverse Galfon transform of f. But what is uh, this? But we know that the Gelfand transform, hence also its inverse, uh, preserve the spectrum since it's an isomorphism. So this is just the spectrum of f. But where is f? F is a C star. F lives in the C star algebra of continuous functions on the spectrum. So this is the spectrum of f as an element of the C star algebra. But what is the element of that? That's just the range. If you have a continuous function on a compact Hausdorff space then the spectrum of that function is the range, right? So this is the range of f, which is f of sigma x. So that gives us the second condition. Uh, the third condition is again, phi is just a matter of changing language. 
phi of f of x. This is phi of gamma inverse f, where gamma is this Gelfin transform. But uh, um, uh, uh, maybe it's not quite so obvious what's going on. <coughs> this case yeah I don't see maybe it's not quite so clear what's going on here but we can fix this with an easy trick so here's how we can see 3 is the first thing to notice is that if f is a polynomial then 3 is obvious right? so this is obvious when f is a polynomial in z and z bar. And then the other thing is that, again, by the stone weierstrass theorem, the polynomials are dense in the space of continuous functions. All right, so for general, uh, in general, uh, we take polynomials, say Pn, such that uh, f minus Pn and sup norm go to zero. So this is the sup norm on the spectrum of x. So this is as elements of continuous functions. Okay. So that's possible by the stone weierstrass theorem. And then what can we say? Then we can say that phi of <coughs> f of x minus f of phi of x. So the norm of this. And now we can take an approximation. Uh, yeah, that works because we know that the spectrum here will also be contained uh, in continuous functions on x. So we can approximate this uh, by polynomials. And here, I guess we have to put in um, we know that homomorphisms are contractive, so here we can also approximate by polynomials. Uh, so this is uh, less than or equal to the lim soup, and here we have phi of pn of x minus phi uh, minus pn phi of x and then plus phi of pn minus f x plus uh, pn minus f phi of x. All right, and like I said, this is obviously equal to zero. This is, since phi is contractive, this is dominated by the norm of this which is dominated by the sup norm of pn minus f. And similarly, this is dominated by the sup norm of pn minus f. So this goes to zero. All right, so that shows three. Um, four is, again, a little bit of diagram chasing, uh, maybe. Take a look at my notes real quick. Um, can you do the same follow uh, For four, maybe so. Like approximately outside uh, polynomials. Approximate G by polynomials. Uh, I say that again? Obvious yeah, that should be obvious, but uh, it's even easier than that. Uh, I mean, you could also probably approximate by polynomials, uh, <coughs> but I think you can even do it even easier. 
Uh, I can't find that page of my notes I was looking at, though. I'm not sure what I did with that page of my notes, so. But yeah, you can approximate by polynomials or else uh, it should just be more or less obvious because what is g of f of x? Uh, so this is, this is the inverse Gelfand transform of G, but this is the Gelfand Kranz transform corresponding to the C star algebra generated by f of x. Uh, so we need to see, I claim that this should be equal to G compose f, so we need to look at uh, G compose f at x, and we need to compute the Gelfand transform of this in the C star algebra generated by f of x. So this is what we need to compute. So let's go ahead and, and uh, compute this. So this is some continuous function on, remember we're identifying the spectrum of the C star algebra with the spectrum of f of x. Uh, no, that's how you define, so this, we know how to compute, I'm going to compute it up here. So I'm going to, so we have, yeah, so it's, we have the, so this, the definition of this is given by the Gelfand transform course corresponding to the C star algebra generated by X. But now I'm going to compute also what it is, what's the Gelfand transform of the C, with respect to the C star algebra generated by F of X. And then we'll see that these things match, and that, that therefore they'll they'll give the equality we want. Right? So again, it's a little complicated notationally, but this is some element of our C star algebra generated by f of x. That's clear. So let's go ahead and compute what is the Gelfand transform. Right? So the Gelfand transform. So this is some function. It's a continuous function on homomorphism here, but we're identifying that with the with the spectrum of f of x. So which is the range of um, uh, yeah, so the spectrum of f of x we know from number two is the range of f. So let's plug in what happens when we take f of t, where t here is in the uh, spectrum of x. So this element, how do we identify it as a homomorphism here? f of t is the element which just takes this element to f of t. So when we uh, identify this here, uh, let's see, f of t is the element which takes this to f of t. Um, however, what do we know? We know that therefore, when we look at the Gelfand transform of the C star algebra generated by x, this is, this is exactly um, f applied to the homomorphism which takes x to t. So what I, what I claim is that this, uh, mapping right here should give us exactly um, g of f of t is what I want to say. Does that make sense? Because the Gelfand transform takes g to g to whatever this pl has plugged here. This is what I claim. However, this is also the Gelfand transform of the C star algebra generated by, by x of g of f of t. Uh, no, that's not what I want to say. C star algebra of f of t uh, of g of f of x. at t. Yeah? Okay. 
So this equality should be exactly the same as 4, if you stare at it for a moment. Does that make sense? Sorry, the notation maybe is not so clear because uh, the functional calculus is defined as the inverse image of the Gelfon transform, but we also have this identification up there, which I haven't given notation to, so it gets a little confusing to get that. Probably, maybe I should have given notation to that uh, homeomorphism that we've defined up there, and things might be a bit more explicit. Um, okay, I was hoping to avoid some diagram chasing, but I think it's clear, at least from this point, that uh, four holds. Uh, and finally, five. Why should 5 hold? Uh, first thing we have to check is why should the spectrum of Xn be contained in some neighborhood of the spectrum of X? So note, uh, if we have Xn converging to X, and if we have, say, Tn in the spectrum of Xn, well, the first remark is that, uh, so, um, because Xn converges to X, the sequence is bounded in norm, so we know that therefore this, this sequence also has to be bounded in, in absolute value, um, just because we have some, everything's happening in some uniform ball. Um, so therefore maybe passing to a subsequence, we let's assume that the Tn's converge. So that, uh, assume <coughs> Tn's converge to some T. Uh, so then the claim is that this T is in the spectrum of X. So the claim is that T is in the spectrum of X. And that's uh, obvious because we know if it weren't, then we know that uh, X minus T would be invertible. But therefore, we know by continuity of the inverse that something close to X minus T, so if not, if X minus T were, in, were invertible, so then, xn minus tn, since this converges to this, would be invertible for large n. Um, since we know that the invertible element is open, which is not the case. So therefore, we get that t is in the spectrum. Uh, but that means that it's impossible. Uh, so that means that tn has to eventually always be inside omega, because omega contains some neighborhood of the spectrum. So we get that, therefore, Tn is in omega for n large. But we took an arbitrary sequence in the spectrum of the Xn's, and so that this means that the entire spectrum has to be in omega. Otherwise, we could find some sequence where it didn't happen. So we get that, therefore, the entire spectrum of Xn is contained in omega for n large. So otherwise, we could choose such a sequence. Um, all right, so that at least shows that the spectrum is contained in there. And then finally, to show this last condition, uh, we'll again use stone wire strauss and approximate by polynomials. Uh, so uh, take uh, polynomials, take a poly so fix, say, epsilon greater than zero, take a polynomial, and z or z conjugate, uh, p, such that p minus f, an infinity norm uh, on omega is less than epsilon. And then we see that f of x minus f of xn. Uh, so this is uh, we just approximate by p. So this is less than or equal to f minus p times the norm of xn plus, so this is in this, plus f minus p times the norm of x plus p of x minus p of xn. And we see that all of these go to zero as n goes to infinity. Okay. All right. Any questions about that?
All right, so that's continuous functional calculus.